Hey guys, Taki here. Today we're gonna to take a deeper look at Aya's largest handheld. This is one that we've looked at previously on the channel in a Steam Deck comparison video, but we now have a version that should be representative of the retail version. This is one of the biggest devices on the market and it's also the most expensive handheld that I've seen, but is it worth the asking price? Let's dive in. I already went through the unboxing experience in my first video, so I'm gonna speed run this unboxing. The thing that we care the most about is the device itself, not the super fancy box that it comes in. I do have to open this up because I'm planning to swap out the drive that is in this with the original one for my black prototype that I have. That will speed up a lot of the annoying things that I would have to do to get this ready to film. It will also allow me to talk about the serviceability of this big thing. If you've seen Aya devices before, you know that they go to great lengths to hide the screws that hold their devices together, and this one is no different. Unlike the Aya Neo 2 and the 2S, the screws on this are hidden behind things that do not use adhesive strips. These side panels are a bit annoying to get off while trying not to ruin the clips that hold them in place, but I was able to get them off after trying a few prying tools. Then, it's just a matter of removing the screws on both sides, on the bottom, and on the top under the top rail. This does feel a bit excessive at times when you compare all of this to how easy it is to service a Steam Deck, for example. I used a plastic pick to open up the shell, and I was happy to see that I did not cause any visible damage at all. Once we are inside, the SSD that we need to get to has a few things that are in the way. We need to remove this daughter board that houses the SIM card slot and the SD card reader. Ideally, you'd want to remove the battery before doing any of these things, but that seems to be impossible without removing some other components. I'm planning to keep this 4TB drive stock because I'm thinking about giving this device away, but here's a closer look at the make and the model of what I was sent. This version of the device did not come with a 4G network card, but this is the thing that I was not allowed to film in my first video in case you were wondering. Unfortunately, I've been told that we cannot use another SSD inside the slot that this card goes in. Anyway, I've got my one terabyte drive ready to go, so I'm going to speed through the rest of the assembly process with the help of my little engineer. Now that we've finished the SSD swap, let's go over the pricing and the specs of this unit. The Ioneo Big Chan comes with a Ryzen 7840U with a max TDP of 54 watts and an AMD Radeon 780M. The unit that I was sent came with 64 gigabytes of LPDDR5X RAM running at 6400, and this had a four terabyte drive in it before I downgraded to my older one terabyte drive. The screen is the star of the show at 8.4 inches with great color reproduction and an astounding max peak brightness of 700 nits. Outside of that, we have a 75 watt hour battery, Wi-Fi 6E with Bluetooth 5.2 is default, but you can add 4G support with a separate network card. As for the pricing, this SKU comes in at a whopping $1,699, which is by far the most expensive handheld that I've ever reviewed on the channel. They still have early bird SKUs available for all of their configurations, and the cheapest big fish will set you back a cool grand. Before we do anything else, let's quickly go through some benchmarks on this beast. Starting out at 15 watt, we got a score of 2271 overall for TimeSpy. I also wanted to test this out at 54 watts since they advertise that this device can go that high. While running the 54 watt benchmark with the device propped up, I took some quick thermal readings from the device. It is largely pointless to ever run a 7840U up this high, so I know for a fact that I would never use this setting, but the fan seems to be able to move a lot of the heat at the expense of sounding like a jet engine. For 54 watt, I got a score of 29.37 overall. I have seen higher scores than this, but usually with 7500 RAM. The review unit that I was given came with a locked BIOS with no ability to change the RAM speed, so this is how I'm going to review it. I also went ahead and did 15 and 54 watt CPU benchmarks with Geekbench 5. At 15 watt, we are at 1535 single and 6050 multi. Those jump to 1683 single core and 9654 multi-core at 54 watt TDP. Now, in terms of the physical layout here, I've already talked about all of the stuff in my first video, so I don't really wanna go over all of that again. The only difference this time around is that we have a different shell color. 
What I will do is show some of the detail shots of this just to give you a better idea of the material quality. From what I am seeing, this shell seems robust, and as you already saw, this is after I already opened it up to change out the drive. After spending time with the black unit, I would say that this white one is the better option of the two. The only thing that I don't like about this is the two-tone shoulder button assembly. It might not be as flashy, but this would have looked better in all black or white if that were an option. And in case you were wondering, the thing that I was not allowed to film last time was this slot under the kickstand. There's no 4G modem in this version, so this SIM card slot was covered by a sticker before I removed it while I was doing that SSD swap. I know a lot of you want to talk about this D-pad, so let's do that now. Unfortunately, we live in a timeline where a lot of companies are using circle D-pads in their handhelds, and I see no signs of that stopping. From reading the comments on YouTube, I know a lot of people don't like them. Personally, I don't mind as long as they're done well. I have not seen that done yet, and that includes this device. When I say done well, I mean that there would be no difference between me using a circle D-pad or a normal one. What we have on Big Fish is an 8-way D-pad that uses conductive rubber. I picked this game in particular because it came with one of the last good systems that used a good circle D-pad. For games like Sonic where you don't need a ton of precise movement, this circle D-pad doesn't really do anything wrong. If I were to play older platforming games, the only thing that I would notice is that the D-pad rubber feels a bit on the soft side. Gearing up for this review, I did a video on this thing, which is a Genesis-style controller from Retroflag, and it also uses a circle D-pad, but I would say this is a good one. When I was talking about finding a good circle D-pad that wouldn't leave me feeling wanting by not having a normal one, this would fit the bill because it feels good enough and it does not bother me at all. The good thing about this controller and this INEO device is that the circle D-pad can easily be removed by pulling up on it. If you look at them closer, it's just a round top that has a cylinder on the bottom to slide into the assembly. The only downside is that these aren't the same size, so this part is not interchangeable. That doesn't mean that it's impossible to get this done. If someone had some basic CAD experience, they could make a 3D printed part to change this style, and this is something that is not easy to do on other handhelds that also use a circle D-pad. Now, is it likely to happen that someone would actually do a DIY mod for this, given that this price is so high? No, but it probably would have happened if this thing were around $500 to $700. To be clear, this D-pad seems much better than other handhelds that also use circle D-pads, but I think it could have been a home run instead of first base. I have not used this device in a few weeks, and I did that so I could show how it is to use the D-pad on a blind run. Starting with the Akuma test that I usually do, I'm just trying to get four simple moves, with Dragon Punch being the only one that should give me trouble if this was a bad D-pad. At first, I'm not having a whole lot of luck here with the moves that I'm trying to do, but I can get them occasionally. I would say the only thing is, even in times when I'm getting the move, I don't feel confident that I'm going to get the move until I see it happen. If this were a normal D-pad and I was doing these moves, I would know for sure that I was doing the combo correctly and that the character would do the move that I wanted to. And this just illustrates that you've got to get used to this D-pad. Right now, I'm not used to it because I haven't used this in a long time. While I'm doing this, the softer feeling of this is a bit abnormal and I'm not in love with the fact that this doesn't have any tactile feeling to it. And as you can see in the third round, I'm getting a few dragon punches, but it's still not consistent. I'm going to fast forward a bit to get to the next important point. This seems to be the point where we have broken through. Now we're getting a ton of these in a row. This is what I was hoping to showcase in this video. The D-pad is objectively not bad in the respect that you can play these fighting games way easier than you could with a traditional D-pad, but you have to get used to it first. It does still feel weird when I'm doing these moves, but they are easier to do than normal. I'm just not always confident that the move will work correctly due to how easy it is and the lack of tactile feeling that I get when I'm doing it. But as you saw, it took me a few rounds and now I can pretty much spam dragon punches all day. This is exactly how it was the first time I used the black INEO that I was filming with the Steam Deck. Our next topic is 1600p gaming. 
I'm kind of burnt out testing 7840U devices since they are all pretty much within 10 to 15% of each other, assuming their voltage curves are the same, and this one is no different. What I want to focus on is whether or not this screen is a waste since I saw that comment from a few people in my last video. To address that topic, we're going to look at a couple of PC games. The first game is not that new of a game, but we're running it at 1600p which is the max resolution of this device. This is low settings with no FSR, and at 20 watt TDP, we're in the 40s, which is not that bad. If we open up the ISPACE software and fight with this TDP control raid boss for a bit, we can bring this up higher, but we don't see a change in our FPS. So I would not expect to be able to play at this resolution without some compromises. That would either be using FSR or settling for sub 60 FPS. We just don't have the GPU power that we would need to get this off the ground at this resolution. A 40 hertz lock would be useful in situations like these, but it's not universal for this resolution. If we go down to 1200p with this same game, we can hit 60, and the game doesn't look noticeably worse like it would if this was an 800p display and we were dropping even lower. Let's take a look at another game. All right, so our next game is Elden Ring, and this is another one that we've looked at plenty of times. Let's start by going into the settings to see what we're working with. We are at 800p low settings, which gives us decent FPS at our TDP. The problem is that we don't see a significant improvement going from 15 to 54 watt TDP for a game like this. This is why I would say I would never go up this high on this processor. You just end up wasting power because the GPU is already bottlenecked. We could get higher FPS than this if we were using 7500 RAM, but again, the review unit that I was sent has a locked BIOS with 6400 RAM, so that is how I will test it. After bumping up to 1200p, we don't have enough power to play this at 40 FPS. The GPU is still bottlenecked. At 1600p, it's the same situation. The game looks nice at this resolution, don't get me wrong, but this game takes a ton of power to play at this resolution. You would really need a dedicated GPU to make more games a reality on this hardware at this resolution. If we settled for a console 30 with an FPS lock, we could play this game at this resolution with 30 watt TDP. I've got six more games for this performance showcase, three that have trouble at 1600p and three that run just fine. The first game is Stray at 1600p. For this processor, we need to drop the resolution scale down a bit to use this resolution. The good thing about having a resolution scale option is that we should be able to drop things to the point where this game can run at 60 FPS, but the rendering quality won't be as good. We are not that far from 60 FPS with these settings, and the game looks amazing on the screen. You cannot underestimate how good this panel is. If you saw my last video, you know this panel is a killer, and if you're playing games with a lot of dynamic range and a lot of different colors like this one, you will appreciate it. We still have dips in this game, so you would need to scale down even further, but the game doesn't look that bad to the naked eye. It just comes down to what you're willing to accept if you want to push up that resolution. Our next title is Sekiro at 1600p. I'm using 30 watt TDP with the fourth 2 watt TDP that is still in IA software for some reason. This is at low settings and it's holding up pretty well. It's also a big trade-off because you could lower the resolution and increase the graphical quality. This keeps things above 30 FPS, so this would be a good candidate for a 40 hertz lock. Our final heavier title is Batman Arkham Knight. This game also looks great on this screen. We don't quite have the ability to hit a solid 40 throughout, so this would either be a 40 hertz lock or a 30 FPS lock to keep it at a console 30. This is a good time to point out that the cooling system is putting in a lot of work right now. At 30 watt TDP, our CPU temps are at 62 Celsius and our GPU is at 64 Celsius. These are low values for this TDP and if you consider that the Steam Deck can go well over 80C at 15 watt TDP, you can appreciate this improvement. Now let's look at games that can run at 1600p at 60 FPS. Our first game is Skyrim, which is an older one. This gives you an idea that you're going to be playing a lot of older games at this resolution if you want 60 FPS. The benefit is that these games look awesome. I'm using low graphical settings right now, since I always do, but I probably could have gone up a bit higher. I just want to keep things the same without making any arbitrary changes. I just need to find the TDP range that I need to use to get this at 60 FPS. 
I have to get out of the mindset of how I would approach TDP adjustments with normal handhelds. I keep forgetting that the battery that's in here is huge. So 22 to 25 watt TDP is going to go a lot further on this battery than it would on something like the ROG Ally, for example. I usually target 15 watt TDP, but that goalpost moves up when your battery is an absolute unit. The second game is Monster Hunter Rise. This one isn't that old, but it's easier to run at higher resolutions. At 1600p with low settings, it has no problem hitting 60 at lowish TDP. The last PC game is Hades. I have this set at 30 watt TDP, but I don't think that it needs that much. If it did, I would be more willing to just drop the resolution since this game can run at under 10 watt TDP at lower resolutions. Generally speaking, 2D games won't cause you a lot of problems running them at 1600p with this processor. So we've just looked at PC gaming at 1600p and the types of compromises that you would need to make if you want to hit that mark. Where I see this screen has a clear advantage over everything else on the market is in emulation. And that's due to the fact that we can increase rendering resolution up very high for these old games while keeping the TDP at a reasonable level. Our first system is Nintendo 64 and I have the resolution bumped way up to take advantage of this screen. These games look crisp and amazing. So if you like emulation and you want the ultimate emulation experience in an emulation handheld, this appears to be it. I'm not gonna cover the full gamut of emulation because I've already done emulation on 7840U way too many times, but I'm just gonna dipstick into some of the systems that I think I would play on this device. GameCube is another one where we're able to bump up the resolution high enough to take advantage of the screen while still keeping things at a reasonable TDP. So if you wanted a GameCube emulation machine with super sharp visuals and awesome color saturation, this is the handheld for you because the picture as I am seeing it in person looks amazing. I don't know how it's gonna look after YouTube slaps this with a compression bat, but in person, this is the best GameCube experience that I have seen to date. If you wanna bump up the resolution with PlayStation 2, then you're gonna to have to increase the TDP a bit because this is a lot more demanding across the board compared to the previous ones. The games still look great as you'd expect, but it's just sad to see that it comes with PC gaming TDP levels. And again, I've already taken a deeper look at what the 7840U can do with higher end emulation, especially on iNeo devices. There's nothing that any other 7840U can do that this can't. If you've seen one, you've seen them all at this point. Because I haven't talked about the weight or the comfort of this device, I wanted to do a separate section right here just to go over that. In terms of weight, I think everybody can see that this is a beefy handheld. At two pounds or 950 grams, this is not a light handheld, but I don't think it's bad for the kinds of ways that you'd actually use it. I don't think you will use this thing walking around or holding it up from a surface for extended periods of time. This thing seems destined for playing from your lap with a huge screen or on a table or a desk. If you do something like that, the added weight isn't an issue. When it comes to ergonomics, the device feels comfortable in my hands. Most of the face buttons are easy to get to without making huge movements and the shoulder buttons are also very good. The only buttons that are not great are the four buttons on the back. Those should be in a different position or wider like they are on the Steam Deck. When it comes to the bottom track pads, those are not overly useful on this device. I find that I only ever tend to use the bottom right one for precise mouse movement. It's not in a good position to think about using it while playing games, so I would say it's a toss up over whether or not these should even be included in this device in the first place. I hope that helps clarify things if you were looking for more info. Let's wrap this up with the pros and cons of this beast. When it comes to the pros, I've boiled things down to three points. The first pro is the screen. In fact, if there is only one reason to even consider this device in the first place, it is the screen and nothing else. The screen is brighter than other handhelds that are on the market, and at 93.5% P3 coverage, it is super accurate. The second pro is the battery. With a 75 watt hour battery, this thing is a road warrior. The final pro for me is the cooling. 7840U has huge diminishing returns at or above 28 watt TDP and this fan does a better job at moving that heat than other INEO devices. When it comes to cons, I only have two points. The first and the biggest is the price. At $1,000 for the cheapest unit on offer, this puts this new INEO device into the niche range compared to what is on the market today. Before ROG and Lenovo entered the market, this price would not be out of the ordinary, 
but the market as a whole is settling around 512 gigabyte Steam Deck pricing, so fewer and fewer people are even considering devices that are this expensive. That's not to say that this couldn't be worth $1,000 to $1,700, because it could. This exact device as it is now, with an NVIDIA or an AMD dedicated GPU, would be worth every dollar. It would also be much better than other mainstream devices that are on the market right now. The second con for me is the tactile feeling of the D-pad. As I pointed out in the big D-pad section that I did, this D-pad works well for fighting games once you get used to it, but it doesn't feel as good as it could. If it had a different style topper with a different texture or a slightly stiffer conductive rubber pad, it would have been a pro for me instead of a con. But that's all I've got for this one. As I mentioned, I'm trying to find a good way to give away the device that I showed in this video. It's worth a lot more than anything else that I've given away, so I'm trying to find a good way to make that work. If you enjoyed this video and you want to see another, watch my recent video on the R35S. Happy gaming, everyone. Talk to you out. <laughs>